Okay, the next topic is basically the uh, core kernel interprocess communication and processing mechanisms that Linux provides and Android Linux. So we'll talk about Android Linux's local and remote communication mechanisms. We'll talk about how Android Linux supports processes and threads, which are there to do a variety of things, but for the purposes of this course, probably the most important thing is to mediate access to the underlying cores. So let's talk about IPC first. So Android has a bunch of interprocess communication or IPC mechanisms, and they're used to be able to do various things. They mediate interaction between apps and system services. They're used to be able to communicate between an app on the phone and some piece of the app running in a cloud service somewhere, and there's a whole bunch of them. They're important for clients, because that's how the client's going to talk to the outside world. And of course, they're also important for servers. We're not going to talk much about the server side of this stuff. But the cool thing is, as we'll see in a second, that the primary means by which you communicate from the client, the app, to the server, which is the server part of the app, uh, is through standard protocols that everybody implements. So once you know how to do it here, you can use it other places. So Android supports TCP IP which, as you probably know, is the uh, transmission control protocol, sometimes called the transport control protocol, TCP. And that runs over top of the internet protocol. And that allows you to be able to communicate in the internet. Hopefully, everybody knows what the internet is at this point. Uh, and the key layers at TCP IP address are transport layer, which is the TCP part, and the internet layer, which is the IP part. And then there's other layers here as well, which I won't really go into a lot of detail at this point, but uh, you've certainly used a lot of these things before. You've undoubtedly used HTTP when you browse the web. You might have used FTP or some kind of secure FTP to transfer files. There's a bunch of things that you don't often work with directly, but if you set up a mail client on your device, you may interact with POP or IMAP and so on. You probably SSL'd into something. You can do secure login and so on and so forth. TCP IP is really optimized for network communication. And built into the TCP protocol are all kinds of clever tricks for trying to be able to do things like sense network congestion and slow down the rate at which the data is being sent to avoid trying to overwhelm the network and so on and so forth. So while that's a useful protocol for talking for your, from your device to somewhere else, it's probably, in fact, it really is not the right thing to use if you want to talk between applications on the same device or between an application on the device and a system service on the device. So to handle that kind of communication, there's a couple of different ways things work in Android. Uh, one is to use something called Unix domain sockets, which are also sometimes called local sockets as opposed to remote sockets. And these are used for communication between processes running on the same device. So if I'm using my Android phone and I've got an app like the browser or I've got an app like the uh, image crawler that you guys have been working with, when it needs to interact with the window manager to update the display, it uses a Unix domain socket to be able to send the data from two different application processes, or more specifically, an application process and a system service process, both of which run in largely in user space and which communicate by passing messages back and forth through this Unix domain socket. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this if you take the course next semester. I'll go into more detail about how Android does that. But for now, just imagine there's a queuing mechanism that allows things running in one process to communicate with things in another process by passing messages that go through the operating system kernel. That's basically how it works. And this is optimized for intra-host interprocess communication. In other words, things are on the same device. And a lot of stuff works this way, although there are some things that where Unix domain sockets are insufficient. And one of the reasons why the Unix domain sockets are insufficient is they, like the TCP IP sockets, are essentially byte stream oriented. So they provide reliable communication, but they're byte stream. And that means that there's extra work that has to be done by the sender and the receiver to, to chunk these things up into packets or frames or messages, whatever you want to call them, in order to be able to work and manipulate them as they are sent from senders to receivers. 
So for that reason and for some other reasons as well, Android also provides something called a binder driver, which is a special device driver that's very Android-centric, although it got its start in a different operating system called the BIOS or BOS. And uh, the binder driver basically is a special kind of driver that really is intended to be able to support message-oriented communication between applications on a device. So for example, if you have a media service and it's talking to some kind of music player app, then they'll be using the binder driver to, to do various kinds of interactions. Um, in particular, the, the application it's running will send operations like start playing a song, stop playing a song, uh, play a new song, suspend this song, resume this song, give me a list of songs. All, all these kinds of things you can do on songs and so on are all done by making essentially method calls that end up sending messages under the hood through the binder driver. So this is not standard. T TCP IP is standard. Unix domain sockets, standard on Unix at least. Binder driver is an Android-centric kind of thing. And it's used to get better control and higher performance for Android-centric stuff. So it's super duper optimized for intra-host interprocess communication. And we'll talk a bit about this in a bit more detail shortly. All right, so all this stuff kind of begs the question, what the heck's going on under the hood? There's a device driver framework that's essentially the Linux device driver framework that works with a lot of devices that most Linux desktops and servers don't deal with, like touch screens, for example, or uh, radios. And that's done primarily in the operating system kernel space. And you can see basically that you have these low-level data structures that uh, basically mirror what is happening in the hardware so that the kernel can keep track of what's going on with the hardware devices and figure out if they're uh, jammed or if they've got work to do or if you want to give them work to do. And it also m basically mediates between the asynchronous world of hardware devices and interrupts and the more synchronous world of communication and application processes. There's two different kinds of things you have in device framework. There's so-called block-oriented devices that transfer data in chunks. So a good example of that would be reading and writing from files that work on chunks of things because you can address them as a chunk. Say, give me the next 4K. And then there's also things called character-oriented devices. And they transmit data byte by byte. So typically things that inter interact with the user, like serial lines and so on, or, or byte by byte transfers. And the whole purpose of this is just to shield everybody else from these low-level details. Because man, oh man, you do not want to be programming at this level if you can avoid it. It's uh, programming the kernel level and device drivers in, in particular is, is like you know, thrill-seeking. It's kind of like parachuting without a parachute, right? It's really uh, extreme, like extreme skiing or something like that. Um, you have to have very, very low-level knowledge of how hardware works. You have to be able to know how to debug in an environment which may not have much, many tools available for you. So it's, it's a tricky thing to learn how to do. OK, something else which is not quite as tricky but really cool is support for processes and threads. Now, we've talked a lot about threads, so I won't spend a lot of time on threads. I'll, I'll tell you two important things about threads, but um, I want to talk a little bit more about processes and give you a better sense of what they do. And Android uses this stuff in a very interesting way. Um, and one of the things that Android does is it leverages some of the Linux copy on write features of process creation in order to be able to speed the startup time when an app gets launched. And I'll tell you briefly about that. It's something that's called the zygote, which is kind of a funny name. And basically, I think I mentioned this before, processes are used to encapsulate your programs so that they're protected from each other and thereby allowed to be able to do all these things without fear of someone else coming in and snooping and reading their data or stomping on their state. And the other thing that you can do is also map everything to work efficiently on the underlying processor cores. So a process is basically a unit of resource allocation and protection. What the heck does that mean? You're allocating certain kinds of resources like memory that is protected, right? So each process, the memory in the process is going to be protected from other processes. And uh, each Android app typically runs in its own Linux process. So therefore, it's hard to have one app screw up somebody else's uh, you know, state and behavior without 
being a super hacker. It's, it's very hard. Um, moreover, if one app happens to fail, or if one instance of an app happens to fail, that shouldn't affect the behavior of the other apps because they're protected from each other. So if one app goes through and zeroes all of its memory out, other apps are like, I don't care, it didn't, didn't affect me. Um, it also is used to make sure the app data is private because each application gets its own protected address space. And the virtual memory manager we just talked about is used to control all that kind of good stuff. Every process has one thread by default. Now, the way this works in Android is kind of funny because, again, if you take next semester's class, you'll learn more about this. But there's a, a main thread. Every, every app has a main thread, which is called the UI thread. And so by default, the main thread of the process is used by the basically the main thread of the app to do its thing. It'll run the, the event loop to do all the processing. And in Android, that main thread, that UI thread, is used to dispatch events to the various widgets and other user interface toolkit components to do views and menus and dialogues and interactions and all that kind of good stuff and animations. Anything basically that interacts with the user is going to go through that, that one thread. Now, it turns out, of course, that we can have a lot of other threads. And we've talked about this before. But the key thing to remember in Android is that these threads actually appear at multiple layers in the software stack. Remember we talked about layers before? So there's, there's kernel level threads. This is what the operating system kernel provides. We have POSIX threads, which are basically a, uh, a wrapper around the kernel level threads, giving the standard POSIX C API for thread management. We've got Android threads that the virtual machine knows about. We have so-called Java threads, which work in conjunction with the Android threads and the POSIX threads and the kernel threads in order to get their, their work done. Basically, all the stuff that's above the kernel, of course, is running in user space. And it's relying, of course, on things like the Java memory model in order to be able to make sure that things don't accidentally corrupt each other internally. Java is much better about that than, than C and C++, of course. We're mostly going to focus on kernel threads here. Um, we've talked about threads at other layers. So a thread provides a unit of execution for instruction streams that run on processor cores. So the thread is really the thing, ultimately, that's going to be running instructions. How does the thread start to run in Java? What's the way it begins executing? How do you, uh, let me rephrase the question. How do you give a thread something to do in Java? What's that? Uh, you could fork, that's right. Although that's more a thread pool. That's more the fork joint pool. What, what's the real basic way of doing it? You're, you're still thinking about fork joint pool. I mean, that you're not incorrect, by the way. But what's the more fundamental? What's the most fundamental way you make a thread in Java? Right, so you, you could either make a runnable and then say new thread start, or you could extend thread and override the run method, or you could give a lambda express. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can do it. The key point is when you call start, what's the thing that actually begins to execute stuff? I'm looking for a single word that has three letters in it. Come on, guys. What, what is, what's, what's the one and only method in runnable? OK, run. Right, so run. <laughs> so that's how execution begins. When a thread starts, it runs, and its run hook method begins to execute the stream of instructions. Right, It's whatever happens after run begins to be called. By default, there's one thread. You can create lots of other threads if you want to using a variety of means, like making a new thread, or using the thread pool, as you guys said, or using streams, in which case it's all handled for you underneath, under the hood. And of course, these threads can run, many threads can run over one core, or they can run in parallel on multiple cores. Now, here's the thing you need to know, because it's definitely going to be on either the next quiz or the final exam, one of the two, or both. Um, some of the resources that a thread has are unique to each thread. They're not shared with anybody else. So 
the runtime stack. What's the runtime stack used for? Function calls, method calls, exactly. Program counter just keeps track of where you are in your instruction sequence. Other registers you might have, like a frame register and other kinds of stuff that you need to push and pop as calls are made and so on. Each thread has its own stack, as you can see here, right? There's a stack of things there. Other resources are shared by all threads in a process, but may or may not be shared across processes. So things like files that are open, those will be shared by all the threads. May or may, or may not be a good thing, by the way, but they are. Um, certain kinds of memory, like, you know, sort of global memory or the heap memory or static memory, you know, there's certain types of memory that are shared by, by all threads. There's other kinds of memory that's specific to a thread called thread local storage in Java or thread specific storage in C++ and C. But the key point here is that some things are shared, some things are unique. So that's one of the key things to remember. Now, one of the other things to remember is if you have a process and you fork it. Now, this is one of those unfortunate situations where the word fork is used in two different ways, right? So we've primarily been talking about forking from the point of view of the fork join pool. Forget about that for the discussion here. When you fork a process, what it does is it makes a copy of the process. So all the files that are open are still open in the, in the child process that, that's been forked. Um, all the memory and other resources are also shared. And Android leverages this feature when it boots up to do something called the zygote process. And the zygote process, when it starts, it's one of the first processes that starts when Android boots. And it goes ahead and it loads in pretty much every imaginable library that your typical application is going to need, right? So all the Java libraries, all the Android libraries, and so on. So this zygote process has got everything loaded into its virtual memory. And when you start an app, what that app does is it works with the underlying Android system services, and the zygote basically forks itself, thereby giving the newly created process to run the app a pre-initialized set of all the libraries that that app is going to need in order to do its thing. So that is used to optimize startup. So they pack everything that you can possibly imagine into the zygote, and then they simply fork that in order to make a copy so that you don't have to waste a lot of time starting things up because people don't like it if their app takes a long time to load. That's annoying. So Android threads, the Linux kernel threads form the basis for all the other threads we've talked about, like the Java threads. And uh, it's important to remember that threads and processes consume a lot of resources. They don't come along for free. It's also important to remember that programming multi-threaded apps is hard. There's race conditions, there's deadlock, other types of hazards. So you need to think very deeply if you want to program multi-threaded apps, especially at the systems programming level, it's really hard. Um, read the documentation to learn how Android does it. I have other stuff we, which we won't have time to get into now, but you can read about online. But the best news is that if you are well-versed in these other features of Java 8, like parallel streams, like completable futures, like the fork joint pool, many, not all, but many of the complexities of the lower level stuff just disappears. And that's uh, maybe very reassuring. All right, that's the end of that section. And so don't forget, you need to do your cleanup for programming assignment number four, which is due on Thursday.